Kumi said they could see and watch the test run. Any chance to mute them? Excuse me? Okay, I think we are live. Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome, everyone, and thanks to all of you joining us from wherever you are around the world. We are glad you could join us today for our first in a series of Google Hangouts. My name is Ahmed Lindau. I'm the UN Secretary General's Envoy in New York, and I will be moderating and presenting now our Hangout today, and also feeding you questions that we received in Facebook and Twitter and different social media tools to our great panelists today. We have a fantastic panel of guests with us today. We have Mr. Richard Dictos, Executive Coordinator of United Nations Volunteers. Thank you for taking the time today, Richard. It's my pleasure. Yeah, and Richard joining us, as you know, from Bonn, and also we have Pratik Awasti from UNFBA. UNFBA is currently the co-chair of the Interagency Network in New Development. And Pratik is joining us from the Third Avenue here in New York. Thank you, Ahmed. It's good to be here. And also we have Mr. Lloyd Russell Moyle, Vice President of the European Youth Forum and also part of the task force of the International Coordination Meeting of Youth Organization. Hey, Lloyd. It's a pleasure to be joining you. Excellent. And also Daniel Espinoza from Mexico joining us today, who is also a, a ma project manager at the Integral Platform of Sustainable Development. And she's also part of Young Go the official youth constituency at the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Hi, Dana. Yes, hi, everyone. So it's a pleasure to be here, too. Thank you. And, and also we have Reem Salman joining us here. And Reem, she is also expert in youth issues and been volunteering and working very closely with UN Habitat youth groups. Glad to have you, Reem. Thank you, Ahmed. Hello, everyone. I'm glad to join you today in this Google Hangout. Well, excellent, and remember that you can tweet your question for our panelists to answer them a bit later using the hashtag you and youth envoy and also using our official Facebook page, the Secretary General's United Nations Envoy in Youth, which will be the page that will be interacting with you. Sure. Of course, if you are watching us live now, you know how to watch us. You can go and tune to the you and web TV and watch us there. Spread the word with your network because we are just starting the discussion. I would like to start out by briefing you all in my new role serving as the United Nations Envoy in Youth. And let me just share with you briefly why we are doing this today and why we are hosting this and why we are talking about this theme, why it's a UN uniting for youth. Because this is exactly the context of the second term of Mr. Ban Ki-moon, the Secretary General's M the Secretary General, of course, when he announced that working with and for young people is a priority for the Secretary General. Three main initiatives were launched. The first is UNV, having a youth modality, and Richard will be presenting that. And the first ever system-wide action plan, bringing all UN agencies to work together on youth issues, and also appointing an envoy in youth issues. As envoy, my work is focusing the first place about being a messenger for the voices of young people to the organizations and to bring the organization, the United Nations work, closer to young people. To do that, we need to promote mechanisms for youth participation. I'm working, working mainly now to explore what kind of mechanisms we can bring to youth participation in order to, to bring young people around the world closer to the United Nations and to align the work of youth organization, youth serving institution, academia, media, and all different stakeholders to work closely with the United Nations. I'm working mechanisms, but also working as advocate for youth issues. That's why you will be seeing me traveling a lot and participating in so many platforms, just always to remind all governments, civil society, private sectors of their commitments and the needs to translate these commitments to action, to invest more in youth issues and to promote more mechanisms for youth participation. We are concerned now about how we can make sure that youth are reflected in the post-2015 development agenda. Just today, I signed a letter to the high-level panel members in the post-2015 development agenda, including recommendations that we consolidate out of hundreds of youth forums meeting online consultation to remind the high-level panel that it's very important to include the youth voices there, 
youth were in the inputs and they have to be in the outputs and we need to make sure that the post 2015 development agenda prioritizing youth issues. Having said that, this clearly reflects my role as advocate in youth issues, but also as a connector and a catalyst and to promote partnerships in youth development. For me, it's only by promoting multi-stakeholder partnerships who will be able to move forward. Working youth issues and the nature of youth issues and the complexity of the challenges we are facing today make it imperative for all of us to come together and join forces for youth development. That's why we are trying to bring the donor communities with the private sectors, the academia, civil society, and youth-led organizations to work all together with member states and the United Nations to achieve more and best more new development. I'm also a harmonizer for the work that we are doing here at the United Nations in a close collaboration with the interagency network in new development. My role here is also to bring more coordination and more harmonization for the work of the United Nations to make sure that we are all delivering as one. And to do that, we need to start with the country teams. And soon, hopefully, we'll be launching advisory boards for the UN country teams at the national level in coordination with the UN agencies to make sure that youth not only participate at the global level, but they are only also have channels to participate at the national and the grassroots level through joining and setting the agenda of the United Nations and setting the priorities for the UN work at the national level. This is a part of what we are offering now, but I'm also trying to open channel of communication with, with young people. That's why I'm hosting today this Google Hangout in a series, and then we'll be launching soon our website, which will act as a platform where you can follow the work of the United Nations at large for young people. Having said that, and again, in the context of the Secretary General of the United Nations second term and his initiatives, one of the most exciting initiatives, I would say, is what Richard will be presenting from UNV. And I'm thankful for Richard's commitment to youth issues. He's young himself, and he is very committed to youth issues. And now UNV, I was just there last week when we discussed the new youth modality that the UNV and the, all the team in UNV are very committed. UNV is a UN volunteers, by the way, so all of you must know that, and we need maybe to teach ourselves to this, uh, uh, use less acronyms to make it uh, uh, easier to follow to everyone. And we'll be now hearing from Richard about where we are and what is the progress with the UNV youth modality and what young people should expect soon from UNV. Floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much for that uh, for that very nice introduction, Ahmed, and very, thank you very much for the opportunity to be able to talk about this. United Nations volunteers were uh, uh, created uh, in uh, 1971 in order to bring volunteering as an important part of the way that the United Nations does its work across the globe. Since 1976, we have been actually deploying youth volunteers and been supporting youth volunteer-led organizations across the world. Currently, for instance, we are supporting the National Youth Volunteer Scheme in Togo, which has about 2,300 volunteers actively engaged in the socio-economic problems of the country. But we're also supporting youth volunteers in sports and sports development in the Ukraine. Just to give you two examples, we've worked with uh, university volunteers in uh, Mexico, to give you an example, where we have been bringing them in to the work of the United Nations, giving them an opportunity to both deliver the knowledge that they had, to contribute to the work of the United Nations, but also to learn, and to learn about the work that the United Nations does, to get develop valuable skills that later on would help them in employment. The new lease of life that we've been given by the Secretary General's pro program is very much around developing the youth voice. Developing the youth voice through volunteering platforms across the world where young people can be safe to volunteer their time, where they can go in order to contribute to development, contribute to poverty reduction, to education, to health issues, but doing it so in a way that is constructive and that is mutually beneficial. They contribute to the work, but they learn new skills. They acquire new opportunities. These platforms also have to be made safe. They have to be free of political interference and making sure that volunteers would never be abused in any way, shape or form. And currently we are operationalizing these new platforms in countries like Tunisia, Morocco, um, Egypt, Jordan and Yemen, where 
we know that there has been a very strong youth movement and where there has been a lot of dynamics about the role of youth in the way that society is being given shape. Now, the last part of the work that we really are eager to do is to actually bring more youth voice into the United Nations. Although Ahmed very kindly said that I'm still young and I will always be young at heart, the reality is that the actual age of a UN staff member is 42. And that says a lot about how the youth voice, therefore, is assimilated in our own organization. So we are currently in the process of mobilizing a virtual armada of young people from the north and from the south to join the organization on temporary assignments for the next period of time. We are working with UNICEF, UNFPA, WFP, WHO, ILO, uh, UNESCO in order to make this a reality over the next couple of years. Let's, however, be very clear. The United Nations is not as large as we like to be. We're not talking about tens of thousands of people who will get opportunities to basically get work experience in the United Nations and contribute to our mission. We're more talking about a couple of hundreds to begin with and then thousands. But these people are going to be catalysts in the way that the organization shifts its minds and integrates the ideas of young people in the way that we work. And this is the essence. It is about voice. It's about rendering voice to you. So maybe on the basis of the questions, I can be more practical and explain more. So back to you, Ahmed. Thank you, Richard. This is very important. And uh, you reminded me as well, uh, just to mention how, how important uh, uh, it's listening and uh, voicing the voice of young people to the organization. And by the way, just as a, a very important reminder here, uh, the purpose of this, uh, this uh, conversation, this hangout today, is in part about presenting this, is the, this development that we have at the United Nations, but also about challenging this and to see how we can make it better. That's where how we have youth voices and uh, youth leaders joining us who will be looking to, to the presentations and providing comments. With that, I will go to Pratik. And just to prove that the Yuan can be young as well. And Pratik is just an inspiring person for me working in UNFBA. And then and he is inspiring in every sense. He is maybe the youngest, he's only uh, 27 years old, and he's co-chair now for one of the most important, I would say, interagency network in the UN system. He will be presenting a system-wide action plan in youth. And just to make it easier to follow and to understand what do we mean by the system-wide action plan, it's exactly the theme of our discussion today, UN uniting for youth. So, Pratik, how the UN is uniting for youth with the system wide action plan. Thank you, Ahmed. Um, I think this is such a relevant theme for us to discuss right now in the UN Uniting for Youth. And what is especially exciting for me is that we actually have so much progress that we can talk about now. First, the Interagency Network on Youth Development. It brings together 30, more than 30 entities within the UN system. So agencies, funds, and programs, offices based all over the world. It brings the entire UN system together who are working on young people's issues. Now together we share information, together we advocate for the issues that we care about, and together now we are developing this system-wide action plan on youth. Now, the name sounds, it's a bureaucratic mess, right? The system-wide action plan on youth. In the UN we get very excited about these sort of things, but what does it mean to the rest of the world? The system-wide action plan on youth is simply a compilation of all the promises, all the commitments that the UN is making towards young people. So for the first time, we're able to see what is it that the entire UN system is doing on youth issues. Like not just UNFPA, not just UNICEF, or not just UN DESA, or UN volunteers, but the entire UN system, here's what it is doing on youth. Now, why is that helpful? It's especially helpful because it allows, at least in my perspective, it allows young people to hold us accountable. So for the first time, young people are able to say, well, here's what the UN is doing on youth. How well is the UN doing this? Is there something else that the UN ought to be doing? And uh, how is it that young people are able to hold the UN accountable? Because at the end of the day, the young people are the rights bearers, and we're, in a certain sense, the duty bearers, along with, along with governments. So for that reason, I'm very excited about the system and action plan. Over the last year or so, we've developed it based on, as you talked about, the Secretary General's priority areas. So on the areas of employment, entrepreneurship, political inclusion, civic engagement, protection of rights, education, including comprehensive sexuality education, and health. So on these areas, we've developed measures and commitments uh, that the UN is going to follow up on. 
So I want to call on all young people to take a look at the system wide action plan. We are coming out with not just a youth friendly version, but generally a reader friendly version. Um, so you'll be able to see what it what it contains. Uh, look at the system wide action plan. See what the UN is doing. Let us know. Now on the second part of interacting with young people, this the interagency network is also now for the first time taking steps to interact directly with young people. Very often, I mean, I remember being a youth activist when. I would try to engage with the UN, and I wouldn't know who to talk to. You know, do I talk to UN DESA, which is the focal point? Do I talk to UNICEF, which works on young people and children's issues? Do I talk to? Now we're to we're bringing together the entire UN system, and we are opening a forum for engagement with young people. So this year, I'm happy to announce that this year, for the first time, we're going to have an open meeting with youth organizations for the interagency network. So we'll do that in August or September. We're very excited, and we're using every opportunity to engage with youth organizations. And finally, the last thing that I want to say about the system wide action plan is that we now call on donors, on foundations, on the private sector, on government, on all the different actors and stakeholders in the development arena to come and engage with the UN, to work with us, to support the system wide action plan. Because no longer can anyone say that the UN isn't working together. We are uniting for young people. As uh, co chairs for this year, UNFPA has brought three issues on the agenda for the, the interagency network. We want to work to put youth issues at the heart of the post-2015 agenda. So I'm happy to hear that you just signed that letter today, Ahmed. Uh, we want to strengthen the office of the Secretary General's Envoy on Youth. So we want to work with your office to make sure that you can become this coordinator, this harmonizer that can bring the UN together. And that we want to, at the ground level, put in place advocacy platforms, put in place interagency networks, and put in place joint programs in countries. So that in every country, the UN is uniting as one, the UN is delivering as one for young people, and that we are uh, reliable and efficient partners in making sure that young people's potential is fulfilled. So that's all that I'll say for now, but I look forward to a discussion afterwards. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Pratik, very much for, for highlighting this uh, important development. And for me, the system wide action plan is exactly that. It's about uh, bringing the UN together to deliver as one for young people. Well, with that, uh, Let's now move, move to our, the questions and answers session, uh, which will start with our young and youth leader participants. We have with us today Lloyd Russell Moyle, Vice President of the Euro European Youth Forum. Uh, so Lloyd, what does these presentations and uh, these initiatives mean to you as a youth leader and also as the European Youth Forum and the International Coordination Meeting of Youth Organization? How do you read these developments and how you plan to interact with this? Um, well, I think uh, we see them very positively, um, but of course uh, the proof is in the pudding, um, as some people would say. It depends on how it changes the lives of young people on the ground. Um, one of the things, for example, the European Youth Forum has been pushing for is a charter for rights for young volunteers, so that no young volunteer um, is uh, is um, is treated badly, um, is out of pocket, etc. Um, some of the things that we've been calling on very much within the um, the ICMEO network, which is the coordination meeting of all the different regional platforms and international organisations, um, is to um, have a better coordination between that uh, that link with the UN and youth organizations and I'm really very pleased about the cooperation that we've started with um, the interagency network on youth development to try and make sure that meeting will happen in September or October but uh, but the question is about how will it change um, some of the big issues that young people are mentioning um, and, and you mentioned yourself are, are for example around how will young people be in the millennium post-millennium development goals, the post-2015 framework. How will young people be um, affected by um, a climate change agreement or a lack of one, for example? So if we're able to, to get strong outcomes in those things, if, if these are tools to facilitate that, to facilitate the UN coming together, then, then they seem quite quite positive. Um, I, I guess the, 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 the question may be, um, would be is how do we use the pre-existing youth platforms and youth organizations 
platforms um, to really continue that, uh, that, that work in creating a long-term platform with the UN, um, a long-term global youth movement with the, with, with, with the UN so that there's a strong, um, a strong youth voice. How can the UN help facilitate that? How can you guys help facilitate us doing that? Not just big organizations, but small youth organizations as well. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Loy. I think yeah, you raised very important points. And, uh, I mean, uh, we should look to the button, as you mentioned. And then <clears throat> the Charter on Youth Rights, which I believe uh, Richard will be commenting on later, and also the work for a global youth movement and what the contribution of the United Nations. I believe these are all very important points. But with that, I would like uh, to go to Daniel in Mexico. And I would like you if, uh, to share with us uh, any comments you have following these presentations. Um, well, maybe I have uh, very quickly my, my question. I have for you one question. For example, we can see that in many countries around the world, especially in Europe, by the way, mm -hmm. many of the organizations are very organized and they have a, a very, very good tools to organize young people. But in, in the case of Latin America, it's a little difficult to us to organize, uh, for, for example, a kind of uh, big event or something like that. In fact, how can we use this exactly these uh, existing uh, platforms to create, for example, a Latin American movement? Uh, because, well, uh, uh, talking about climate change, we are living and experimenting a lot of uh, phenomena uh, about climate change. So we are uh, thinking the Latin American views. We are thinking about to create a international platform, but we need the help of United Nations and of Hello? Hello? I think, I think might have uh, lost temporarily uh, Dana, but uh, with that, I think she, her point was very much clear about uh, uh, it's, uh, it's not always the same in all regions, and sometimes the challenge of uh, how we can build a good movement, a youth uh, movement in other regions, which is feeding very much with uh, what Lloyd shared with us. And uh, this may be put a responsibility in the UN, but also about knowledge sharing and information sharing between the different youth organizations. And I think uh, the youth organization and platforms, they have a role in that, as well as the United Nations. With that, I would like to move to Reem, uh, Reem uh, from Morocco. And uh, I think uh, we've been trying to get uh, more African voices. Uh, she's from North Africa. And uh, unfortunately, we have lost uh, uh, a colleague that was planning to join us, uh, a leader from youth organization uh, in Africa. Uh, and maybe sometimes these technical problems that we face in organizing uh, hangouts and the Skype sessions and all these uh, technologies should remind us that 1.3 billion of our people today still they don't have electricity. And 75% of the world today is not yet connected. So while we are doing and facilitating this discussion, we are very much understand that uh, it's still very challenging for many young people around the world to have a decent access to, to, to internet. So sometimes the problems that we face in connecting is a good reminder for all of us that we should do more in order to, to ensure that more young people, they have access to, to information technology. Uh, with that, I would like to, uh, to leave the floor to you, Reem, to comment on the presentations. Um, thank you, Ahmed. Um, uh, of course, I'm very glad to be here today and to hear uh, from Pratik, uh, the, representing the co-chair of the Interagency Network on Youth Development, uh, and also especially Mr. Dictus from UNV, because I'm very excited about the youth modality in UNV. Uh, to be a strong advocate for you and if I can talk about my personal experience uh, having lived in Kenya we started an organ a youth organization uh, with some students some university students and because we didn't have any funding we relied heavily on youth volunteerism so in that sense my question uh, would be how how can the UN how can we promote youth volunteerism as perhaps the cheapest strategy for achieving the MDGs and then further for effectively integrating youth as drivers of the post-2015 development agenda. 
Thank you. Well, well, thank you very much. <coughs> we are seeing now uh, Bretik twice in the on the screen, uh, which may be because they are two co-chairs for the interagency network in new development. And so you are securing two places in the screen, which is good. <laughs> uh, I would like before moving again to to our panelists and uh, have a more interactive discussion is to get this question from Brea Kanana from East Africa. And she, uh, the question here, what strategies do you have to ensure you take the lead in, in road safety and climate change? And I think as we have asked uh, Diana and our, uh, as the climate change activists, we still need to keep in mind this, uh, this very important area. Another question from Elaine Schiffer from Sweden, and she's uh, saying that a lot of youth uh, are taking the lead in sustainable development. Uh, do you think that the youth will bring this uh, issue to the United Nations and how they can work with the United Nations and the sustainable issues. I believe we have a couple of questions where I would like to leave the floor again to, to Richard to comment and maybe especially on the issue of uh, youth rights and if you think how, how the UNV is planning to, to tackle this issue. Um, thank you, Ahmed. I, I think uh, Lloyd is, is completely right when he says that volunteering has to really change the life of the volunteers who are engaged in this activity and that there needs to be a charter that, that lets down or that lays down the rights of volunteers. Um, we do believe that volunteers should be working in an environment that, that is uh, free of any form of arbitrary behavior, that people need to be decently treated, that people need to be able to indeed have the time to develop and learn while they are volunteering. So part of the work that we're doing, and I think that's maybe the reason why it is important that we talk about the United Nations being engaged with youth volunteering, is that you start working on the standard, that you actually start working, for instance, in the case of Morocco, where we are having a close relationship with various ministries, as well as various of the, of the volunteer sending organizations, that we can have that debate with them about what is the code of conduct that you as volunteer using organization or volunteer uh, mobilizing organization, what's the code of conduct that you need to follow? What is the right kind of behavior? What is not allowed? What are the wrong things to do? Excellence in volunteering we call this and we have this as a service line all across. I think also what is very important is that we don't necessarily talk about, uh, just to respond to something that Rima was saying, we don't talk about volunteering being a cheap, cheap solution. It is a low cost, high impact solution. Volunteers, and particularly young volunteers, can make a connection to other young people in a way that you can never do to some of the formal mechanisms that, that, we, that, we, that we deal with. If you want to have a good conversation with young people about reproductive health or sexual health, if you want to have a good conversation with young people about life skills and topics that relate to employment, obviously this is best done by other young people who have more skills, who have more knowledge, who have coaching uh, capabilities. That is where we believe the issue is not about cost, but it is about impact. It is about people, young people really making, making a very serious difference. The other thing that we have to recognize is that when we are currently talking about, for instance, climate change, we're talking about the global phenomenon. We're talking about something that is as important in the northern tip of Norway as it is in the southern tip of, of Latin America. And this is, again, where youth volunteering can unite the world in action on global problems like climate change. I'm very, very much in favor of the ideas of youth movements, of youth connecting on these issues, mm -hmm. on youth from the south helping youth in the north to come to terms with what this means. Because nowadays nobody has a monopoly on commitments, nobody has a monopoly on knowledge. We all know a lot of things and it is in that exchange that we can make a real difference in the world. Excellent. I mean, I think this is very important point and, uh, and with that I would like to go back to Dana to, to finish her, her remark. Uh, she, she, you started uh, Dana, about talking about the need for youth movement and for youth organization to connect. So could you share with us what you started? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes we do. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So, yes, I was talking about uh, the movements of youth, of course, here in Latin America, even in Africa, and I agree with, uh, 
with all the conversation, but uh, for example, um, last pop in, in Doha, for example, many, many young people uh, wo uh, went there and the problem was, okay, we are here, but what about uh, the information? We need a youth, uh, or maybe with the, the new young people there in this kind of conferences about climate change, we need uh, more the speakable or concrete information, you know, because mm -hmm. most of the time the information has a lot of data, a lot of uh, uh, initials, a lot of letters, a lot of numbers, whatever, and this kind of information it's a little confusing for us because many of us have experience in this, but even for us sometimes it's a little difficult. So people from Latin America, especially rural or indigenous people who had the opportunity to go there uh, has no, uh, was no very very easy to understand all the process especially in Jungo and then in the, all the conference so I think what you can do or what uh, we can do with you to make this kind of difference in the language of United Nations specifically in climate change for example Thank you. I would like to go back to Pratik and ask you uh, a question that we just received and maybe to comment on some of the uh, points were raised by the participants. And the question here, how, how will the UN use the UN International Youth Day uh, this year to better the lives of youth and uh, make sure that uh, young people participate in this uh, event and uh, to advocate for a stronger youth agenda? Thank you, Ahmed. <clears throat> Uh, I want to maybe reflect on on three themes. One is that one is about what Danny just talked about about you know indigenous young people and a wider point about just marginalized young people in general. I think that one of the key roles that the UN can do, one of the key things that the UN can do, is to give a voice to them by showing that they exist. And very often, uh, and the reason I say this is because very often data and statistics gloss over uh, marginalization. It glosses over discrimination. So you see. So, for example, a data or statistics for 15 to 49, for example, or you see young people generally, but it does not look at the differences within. So, so, so one of the things that the UN is able to do and one of the things that we want to do this year is to get uh, information about the realities, about the different realities that young people live depending on, on who they are and where they are. The second thing that I want to talk about, maybe reflect on something that Lloyd said about uh, supporting a youth movement and how can the UN facilitate it. And my answer is simply that the UN is a forum, the UN is a space, and we can provide that forum, we can create a safe space where these discussions can happen. But we have to work in partnership with established platforms, with new and old organizations, big and small, so that we can nurture such a movement. And the last thing, I mean, on, on, on International Youth Day, as always, it is, a, it is a catalyst, it's a point for a lot of mobilization around the world. There's, I think, a lot that's going to happen this year we are particularly excited uh, to see the different activities that come from different parts of the world. Uh, my co-chairs, UN DESA, uh, have put up uh, a website. There's a, uh, I encourage all of you to take a look at the website. People can submit what uh, activities they're undertaking in, and we hope that it will be uh, an important day to bring in the issues of young people, and particularly the issues of migration, which are something that we're uh, discussing this year. Uh, that's all. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, with, uh, talking about the International Youth Day, I would like, I mean, uh, uh, to assure the, that this year we are trying to bring all the events that we are organizing, the United Nations is organizing from the national region, international level, and to bring them uh, together in a way that young people, they can follow and understand them. Uh, Johan, this is, uh, is, is, is working that now and uh, I'll be working with the interagency network to make sure that uh, this year we are uh, presenting the work of the United Nations at large in the International Youth Day and allowing for also access point to young people to come and join us. Uh, I would like also to comment on uh, in the issue of the global youth movement and with that I would like to move the discussion forward to talk about an issue that uh, might be of great importance if we would like to, to make sure that the youth voices are being heard in a structured way. Uh, Lloyd has pointed out to the need for, for bringing a better and a stronger structure for youth, uh, youth groups. And one of my observations is uh, that might be the least funded civil society group in our world today is the youth-led organizations. 
and uh, this should be fixed. We need to work collectively to make sure that youth-led organizations are being supported and being perceived as equal partners in youth development. Young people should not be received as recipients or problems. They have to be considered as equal partners in development. And when we talk about young people, we need to make sure that we are talking about the structures, movements, youth groups, that where, and where youth structure themselves in a way that they think reflect their needs and aspirations and in a more representative and democratic way. For me, youth-led organizations, they are not only important because they provide services for young people, but because they are the place where democracy can be practiced as well, and participation can be practiced at the very grassroots level. Therefore, I join, um, I mean, the call for, for having a global youth movement that can raise the voice of youth organizations. And I believe with the leadership of uh, uh, organizations like the European Youth Forum and uh, with the passionate young people and uh, activists like uh, Dana and um, uh, realizing the need for having better structure for young people, we'll be able to, to invest in that. Here, I take this opportunity to, uh, to uh, again, uh, reassure you that uh, my work uh, and, in, and, and, and all my uh, contribution to youth work as a youth envoy, uh, I'm supporting the, any efforts toward establishing uh, such a youth movement and strengthening the youth-led organization. I believe this is a, a shared commitment from uh, all my colleagues who are joining me now. Uh, I would like to go back to you, Leo, uh, Lloyd, and ask you, how do you see uh, uh, the, the coming opportunities, I would say, uh, or uh, the, the youth uh, calendar or the international youth calendar for the next two years? Uh, what opportunities we have to, to bring youth uh, issues uh, at the forefront of uh, international development? What are the opportunities and how we can, I mean, uh, seize these opportunities? Okay, well, the... Um one of the opportunities that we hope that there will be a strong youth representation um, at is the open working group which will be focusing on um, the uh, youth issues next month um, in New York um, and uh, a number of us will be there to make sure that youth's voice um, is, is very strong. But the problem with, with many of these meetings um, is that funding is scarce and, as, as you mentioned, and, and resources are, are difficult. Governments, of course, have their missions in New York, but there is no youth mission. Why is that? Why shouldn't there be a, a youth mission based in New York, in Geneva, in each of the... Um, in each of the headquarters that can help support that interaction of youth. So that's why the, um, the meeting in September um, or uh, um, I think uh, um, October, depending on when the final date is, with the interagency network, I think is one of the key milestones in making sure it's not just big youth platforms. We've got youth platforms in Europe and in Africa and a, a smaller one in Latin America that's being established. But um, to make sure that all youth organizations uh, of different sizes can come along to that, and that's open to everyone. And then we've also got, uh, coming up next year, um, the World Youth Conference uh, that Sri Lanka have offered, offered to host. And again, that is another opportunity to help spearhead a global, um, uh, a global youth movement. That will only work if we make sure that we involve, at the very beginning, planning and development stages, youth organizations, um, the large big youth organizations and small youth organizations, um, and, uh, and, and yourselves uh, in the UN, to make sure that is really the launch pad for a, for a, uh, for a, um, a global youth movement, or possibly even something like a permanent forum on youth. Um, and and uh, that is an idea that has been developing over the last few months. So there are many things that are going on there, but funding, as I mentioned, is is scarce. And um, and, and maybe the question is um, about how can we link foundations up and how can we link uh, youth and youth organizations up to make sure that uh, we have long-term partnerships and they're not just based on these one-off projects where they give a bit of money, it's a flash in the pan, but then the effect isn't long-term. Well, thank you. I'd like to go back to you, Ian, and ask you, uh, what do you think? What are, the, I mean, some of the opportunities we have now? Thank you, Ahmed. Um, well, I must 
say one thing I'm really excited about is uh, I was at the, the um, ECOSOC Youth Forum on the 12th of March where uh, the ECOSOC Chair, Ms. Ambassador Osorio, announced that ECOSOC will start, will establish the Global Youth Forum and the Regional Youth Forums. Um, indeed, that's, that's something that really proves that the UN is starting Starting to realize and believe that maybe youth should be should have more uh, substantive participation in the UN system. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing how the youth, uh, through youth organizations and networks such as uh, the the European Youth Forum and ICMEO, represented by Lloyd, how these networks can be engaged in the shaping uh, of how how the globe how the global Ecostock Youth Forum will be established. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you. Um, I think with the um, uh, regional and uh, global ECOSOC, uh, ECOSOC Youth Forum, I think this is a, another very interesting opportunity uh, as we are discussing about how the young people can influence uh, the uh, debates at the United Nations between member states. Uh, I can't think of a better opportunity than the ECOSOC, where the Economic and Social Council, uh, if uh, we uh, have uh, at the regional level, Economic and Social Youth Forum, uh, debating the issues and the concerns of young people and then feeding them to the real intergovernmental process at the ECOSOC uh, forum and the uh, council and the different meetings from regional to, to global. That's indeed a very, very interesting uh, mechanism and very structured mechanism for youth participation with the hope that this will enable uh, youth organization to meet uh, and unite. And here just another commitment that whenever we design or we plan things. Uh, it's uh, a genuine commitment here that always to engage youth organization, youth movement, youth structures, uh, because we believe the empowerment for this structure happening by doing. Uh, it's not only by programming, but also by doing, by initiating things and making sure that we are uh, dealing with them as equal partners. Uh, and uh, going back to, to Pratik, I would like to, to uh, hear from you a comments about uh, the coming opportunities and uh, how the inter agency network in new development uh, planning. I know that now we have the system-wide action plan, which is again a work plan for all UN agencies to work together on youth issues. If we would like to translate this to regional realities and national realities, what does the system-wide action plan mean for a young person living in Africa or living, I would say, in, in, uh, in Morocco or uh, in Mexico? How they can benefit or interact with the system-wide action plan in youth? Thank you, Ahmed, and I'm, I'm happy to have the opportunity to make a point at this time. I feel like um, as important as it is for young people to be involved in global policy processes, and, uh, and, and Lloyd knows that, you know, we're working together to make sure that that happens. Uh, we've been very engaged in, in the post-2015 agenda in, in many of the global forums, but it's an important reminder that the UN is not just in, in New York or Geneva. The New York has, exists in every, you know, in, in more than 200 countries and territories around the world. And for us, that's where we're trying to bring the focus of youth participation and youth engagement. And that's where we are trying to, with the system-wide action plan, we're trying to make sure that it gets implemented at the regional and country level. The way that we're doing that is that in the same way that the different UN agencies have come together globally, we are trying to make sure that agencies come together at the regional level. Uh, there are already three fantastic regional networks that exist. We are trying to strengthen networks in the other regions. In many countries, there are already places where the UN has come together. We are trying to strengthen networks in those countries. But what we want at the end of the day is for young people, uh, including adolescent girls, who are often left out of the conversation. Because when you think about youth, the image is often of you know, a 25-year-old man on the streets. But young people also includes you know, a young adolescent girl who might be 10 or 11 years old. Um, so when we think of young people, they have to be able to participate in decision making at places where it's most important to them. So that might be in their families, that might be in their communities, it might be in their village, it might be in their town or city, or it might be in an urban slum, it might be at the you know, district or at the national level as well. The one concrete thing that we're really excited about uh, at the interagency network is that we are committed to opening up uh, advocacy platforms and we're working very closely with UNDP, with UNDESA, with many other UN agencies to set up youth advocacy platforms in at least 15 countries this year. 
So mm -hmm. it's a place where the UN system comes together, we bring the government together, we bring in academia, we bring in the private sector, we want to work very closely with the private sector, especially because of the issues of employment and entrepreneurship that are so high on the agenda. And we bring in youth organizations at that forum at the national level. And we feel like that is going to be a meaningful space for youth participation. And young people are going to be able to input not only on what the UN does, but also on what their governments are doing with their national development plans, with poverty reduction strategies, with national health policies, education policies. And that's where uh, we also want to create spaces for participation. Thank you very much. I think it's uh, a lot of emphasis on the issue of participation. And uh, this is a very interesting. I would like to take this question from Yannick uh, Tona, who was uh, asking him, what is the UN doing to encourage governments and why they don't have a youth representative uh, and the parliament uh, and to, to, to reflect the youth voices as well and maybe to have uh, some contribution to this and to take this opportunity again uh, to remind uh, all of the need for having youth delegates and their official delegation to the United Nations it's very important that uh, more member states uh, sending youth delegates to the to the official delegation at the United Nations and allow opportunity for young people to to see how the discussion is happening and to influence as well some of the youth related uh, resolutions. Uh, we are continuing to, to call always uh, all member states to encourage youth participation in their local uh, governance models and to allow for youth participation from the very grassroots level. Uh, with that we believe always that uh, it's only by enabling more mechanisms for youth participation and to ensure that at the local level, at the national level, youth can participate. Uh, the legal framework needs to be a youth-friendly framework. The laws have to be youth-friendly as well, because without laws encouraging youth participation, allowing young people to run for election and to participate in, in uh, different uh, political processes, we will not be able to, to, to go far. Uh, and also to look for mechanisms, but also again for funding and support and to provide more mechanisms and uh, for capacity building opportunities. One more element that I feel is always important, and uh, with that I would like to go back uh, to Richard. The issue of recognition, recognizing the success stories and recognizing uh, the, the contribution young people can, can make to, to the development of their communities and their societies. I'm sure with you and V, you are I'm, uh, working closely with many inspiring young people who contribute and they devote time to, to volunteer and to join uh, community development projects in their community. What, what, how, what, what is your reflection on that? How do you see we can further recognize the youth contribution and development? Well, what we are talking about from, from a volunteering perspective is actually youth action. It's actually people doing something to change the communities around them. And one of the nicest examples, I think, is the online volunteering modality that we have developed. This is basically a, a place in cyberspace where different organizations can make requests for assistance for online support. For instance, um, during a, a recent uh, humanitarian response operation, there was a difficulty trying to find out exactly who was doing what. And there were not enough people in the country at that moment who could get online in order to generate a map of the different kind of relief operations that were going on. Mm. This request was made into cyberspace 25 youth volunteers working from 25 different localities actually got together and generated this map and kept it updated during the first three months of the relief operation on a daily basis and this is just an absolutely fantastic uh, example of how you can volunteer from wherever you are that you can contribute to the resolution of important problems in different countries by actually still being where you normally are and being part of your normal work. It's got a very low threshold. And an important part of this work, for instance, is that the agencies that have used the services of these young people actually recognize the work that they do, provide them with a certificate of the contribution that they have made, and publicly recognize them on the uh, online internet site that, that still is there for the contribution that they've made. They get gold stars for the work that they're doing. In addition to that, I think, and, and we've, been, been, we've noticed this and, and we, we, we've got some evidence of that, is that those volunteers who've done this later on could actually utilize this, this expert experience when they were applying for different jobs and where they could basically say, well, we have been engaged in this part of the work of the United Nations with, with different online 
tools that we were working on. So volunteering in that sense can actually generate that recognition. Not just recognition in the social circuit, if I can say it, but also recognition within the job market, recognition within society at large. Well, thank you. I would like to go back to uh, our uh, youth leaders and uh, the representative of youth organizations to, uh, I mean, maybe I will uh, find two or three questions together here. One of the, from Meryl uh, Hellman. She's asking about uh, how can we make sure that all the mechanisms that we are talking about are making a real difference at a local level. But if I can combine this question with another from Shirley Adams and from Girls Learn International, uh, about how we can make sure that when we talk about mechanism for youth participation, we are also focusing about uh, young girls and uh, adolescents as well. I'll start with Dana. Can you repeat the question, please? Sorry, the sound is a mess here. Yeah, well, yeah. The the question: How we can make sure that the mechanism we are talking about participation mechanism for young people? How we can make sure that all these mechanisms are making difference at the local level. And why we are talking about mechanisms as well, how we can make sure that uh, young girls and uh, adolescents are also uh, included in these mechanisms and their issues are being prioritized. Uh, maybe I will sound uh, repetitive or something like that, but I believe the first, the first door to to be or to, to have a a great result of this is the communication and is the information. You know, to be inclusive, I believe, or to be inclusive with girls, with boys, with rural and indigenous people, you have to be. Uh, very, very despicable, despicable in your information. So, I believe that with these mechanisms, obviously, all of them are inclusive. I have no doubt about it. But most of the time, the information is not completely clear. For example, we know that exists uh, the United Nations volunteers, but many people uh, ask most of the time, well, uh, yes, I would like to be part of this. But unfortunately, nobody has a clear idea about how to be part of this kind of, of, of mechanism about the United Nations. In the case of Mexico, yes, we have uh, an idea, but uh, not a clear idea too. So I think we have to be very, very clear with the information. So about the gender, uh, I think this question is a kind of gender. Well, around the world, uh, we have many, many mechanisms who, who are uh, working with with boys and girls to be inclusive and to be equal. So I, I think it's not a problem with that. The problem is the information, because it's not clear at all. So I think is that that is my, my answer. Thank you. I will go back to Lloyd. And uh, Lloyd, what do you think? Um, well, I think uh, we already have the words from the United Nations. The Johannesburg Plan of Implementation for Sustainable mm -hmm. Development talks about the establishment of local youth councils. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that's the main way that action can happen on the ground mm -hmm. through coalitions of local people, uh, young people coming together with the support of international mm -hmm. bodies and international treaties. Um, and in a lot of places that's not done. Um, I, I attend many um, conferences with ministers um, and with local authorities and they're reluctant to support their local youth councils because they see them as a um, as a distraction from their core work, not as part of the solution. So the words are there, but some of the action and resources needs to uh, needs to um, follow. I think with um, with young girls, adolescents, marginalised groups. I mean, today is the uh, International Day Against Homophobia, for example, and we've seen in Europe a, a report out um, around um, how young LGBT people still um, face discrimination and violence in in in, in Europe, even, um, and and how this is a big problem. Uh, there, there's there's a couple of elements. There's um, there's education, um, and we need to educate not only um, people to be able to take a stand and organize, but also we need to educate um, young boys 
to not always dominate uh, certain spheres um, of public life um, and we also need to provide resources very often the resources are most easily for um, those who are the most privileged um, and if resources are not distributed in an equal way um, then it, this perpetuation of um, young men um, and then older men um, taking leadership roles will will work and we see the countries at the politic very top political level that do the best with gender equality are the countries that put in hard mechanisms for mm. gender equality that is quotas they're not a very nice mechanism but they're the only mechanism that actually works on gender issues in terms of um, engaging mm -hmm. Uh, things and, and the youth sector is not immune to that and the, um, mm. the UN must also uh, help support that progress as well not just uh, not just enforce it well, thank you Lord I uh, would like to move the floor to Reem Reem the Um, um, on the first question, I think Danai and Lloyd pretty much um, summarized the, the answer, and I would just like to stress on the importance of providing advocates through the establishment of these local youth councils that we're talking about, perhaps through advocating to the UN country teams and the resident coordinators in the different UN agencies that are present uh, in uh, the different countries. Uh, on the question of uh, adolescent girls on the other side, I think one thing that is important and that we are already trying, uh, that the UN is already trying to do through the youth swap is to bring together uh, specialized UN agencies to uh, capitalize on their expertise and resources and bring them together uh, to optimize their effect. So I think the same thing should be done uh, working on uh, adolescent girls' issues, uh, minorities, and marginalized groups. Thank you. Okay, I would like to, to conclude and wrap up now, and I would like just to start again one more round with uh, our youth leaders, and then a very brief to go with our UN speakers as well. And my question is very simple here for our three youth leaders. In one sentence, what do you expect from the United Nations this year? I'll start with you, Lloyd. Um, I expect the United Nations to um, put its resources uh, where its mouth is um, uh, and I also expect it to come out with a, um, a strong youth focus on the post-2015 agenda. Thank you very much. Danai, please, one sentence. In one sentence, okay, I think it's very really difficult to me because I have a bulk of ideas, but I think the same, uh, well, it's not the same, I think it's very important uh, the inclusion of rural and indigenous peoples in all the process of the United Nations, especially in climate change. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they have the answers for many of the solutions of this problem. So why climate change? Because I'm working on it. So I think the, inclusions of the, the, the inclusion of these groups, it's very important to all of us, especially indigenous and rural young people, I think. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure we hear you anymore, but I think it's, uh, we got the message. I would like to pass the floor to Reem. Thank you, Ahmed. Uh, what I expect from the UN this year is to see uh, an actual working result of how the UN will um, integrate the youth perspective into the post-2015 development agenda, uh, including all mar marginalized groups, uh, youth in uh, conflict zones, and yeah, thank you. Including youth in the post-2015 with a special focus on marginalized youth. Uh, with that, I would like to ask uh, our both UN speakers to uh, to also comment on this and to leave us with a message. If we are going to conclude uh, something for our viewers and our youth leaders here, 
and ask them just to leave this hangout with the one message from the United Nations, what it would be, Prati? I would say that under the leadership of the Secretary General, with your leadership, Ahmed, uh, and with the leadership of the Interagency Network on Youth Development, we are in a position where the UN has put forward a bold plan of what we can do for young people and what we can do with young people. Now what we need is for the policies, for the resolutions, for the words, as Lloyd said, to translate into investment. And the UN is ready to engage, as it has never been before. And we are calling on all stakeholders. We're calling on the private sector, on development agencies, on governments, and on young people as well to come and work with us to put forward this bold plan, to make it happen. And within this plan, we are going to focus. We have a commitment as a human rights obligation. We have a commitment to focus on those who are most marginalized. We have a commitment to focus on adolescent girls. We have a commitment to focus on people with disabilities, on LGBT young people, on people, you know, indigenous young people, on refugees, stateless young people. So we are putting forward this bold plan with a focus that looks at the marginalized young people. And we are now ready. Um, so let's, let's make it happen. The UN ready uh, to engage young people at this has never been before. I think this is a good tweet, less than 140 characters. Very good. Richard. Uh, my tweet is probably going to be even less, uh, less long. Um, we are in the process of having the discussion about youth volunteering in five countries in the Arab states. Morocco, Tunisia, Egypt, Jordan, and Yemen. We in this year will be rolling out similar kind of discussions to about 10 to 15 countries in Africa with support of Japan and Germany at this moment. We are slowly being able to build the coalition that allows us to put boots on the ground in a number of countries to start making a difference. That's the commitment that we make for this year. Next year, we'll take Asia and the rest of the world. And finally, if you want to engage in volunteering with the United Nations, join 7,000 young people who are currently working on onlinevolunteering.org. We are representing 169 nationalities in their engagement to make a global change. We're looking forward to see you there. Thank you. Excellent. And would like this as my message as well. Engage with the United Nations. You don't need to work at the United Nations or for the United Nations directly. United Nations is all about uniting nations, based on human rights, security, peace, justice, and human dignity. These are the values of the United Nations. If you believe in these values, you can work with the United Nations. Whatever you are doing, whatever you, kind of projects you are running in your small village or at the national scale or a global event, you can always engage. It's all about having a shared commitment. If you share the commitments we have, then you are somehow working with the United Nations. You can also engage in online. And I'm committed this year to open all channel of communications with you and to encourage the UN system to deliver as one and to put the youth agenda at the center of development. This is my commitment for you, and this is what I'll be doing with all my colleagues. Thank you very much. That's all the time we have for today. I want to extend a special thanks to our distinguished panelists who joined us today. Thank all of you from Denai to Leo, uh, Pratik, Reem, and Richard. And a reminder that you can stay up to date on the continuing efforts of the UN working with and you for youth as the Secretary General of the United Nations declared, working for and with young people. You can always stay tuned with our work and show the official page of the envoy. And with that, you can always, of course, follow the United Nations accounts and all UN agencies. They have their own accounts in Facebook and Twitter. Whatever is your interest and your passion in environment, you can follow that organization that's concerned with the environment and sexual and reproductive health. You can follow that organization. In urban planning, there's an organization and with all the UN system, we're trying to make the UN a bit funkier and easier to follow for all of you. And this is will be the contribution of my website that will be launching soon. Thanks again for all of you for joining us today. And we hope we will join us, you will join us, of course, in our next Google Hangout that will be scheduled sometime soon with other thematic on geographic issues. Thank you very much. See you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you.